Hi, I've um, got a new bit of uh, kit to have a look at today. This is a new um, time of flight camera um, from Soft Kinetic. It performs a similar function to the, um, the Microsoft Kinect, but it does it in a completely different way. Um, this actually measures the amount of time it takes light from its internal illumination to bounce off the subject and then return to the sensor. Um, the two versions, this is the, um, the 311, which is designed for sort of use in like a room style um, environment, a bit like the Kinect. Um, there's also um, the 325, which is a much small, smaller range one, which is designed for my up close use as um, an input device for a PC. Um, this version is a fairly similar shape and form factor to the um, Kinect. It's got this little bracket um, which can either be used as a, a desk stand but also it will wrap around and sit on top of a monitor. Um, it's also got a tripod mount um, which is quite nice. And there's also this uh, wall mounting bracket that the uh, base slides into so you can um, screw it down. Now on the front there's um, two little microphones on either side. There's the actual sensor with its sort of one obvious difference from the Kinect is it's got very it's got a very big lens. There's a standard fairly low res RGB camera as well, and the front's also got the infrared illuminators. You can actually just see this camera's obviously got an infrared filter on it, but um, you can see enough of the um, light to actually see that there's um, two banks of twelve infrared LEDs coming up the front. Uh, on the back there's just, uh, it's got two USB connections, um, one is for data and the other one's for power. Um, this thing comes with an external main supply, to run this at full, full range you need to have the external power supply. Um, it draws about one and a half amps. Um, it will run on um, USB, but it runs in a sort of reduced power mode and it actually seems to, um, it seems to sort of cycle the power up and down, to presumably to reduce the average power. You can, you can sort of see that in the image, but uh, they, there, are, there are a couple of labels that say that that's really for R&D use only, so it's just a convenient way of powering up from two USB um, ports. It comes with uh, this lead, which has got sort of two, two, two plugs on each end, but say lots of warnings saying, you know, just this is really only for messing about, and you really should use a power supply for the full range. I think the... Um, uh, the, the, the shorter range unit is a much smaller unit, it's only about this wide and that will run directly off the of standard USB port because all the power is going onto, onto these LEDs to illuminate it because obviously this has to you know, flood the whole room with the, uh, the light for the sensor to pick, pick up so that's where all the power is going and it does actually have a small fan in the end, it does, does run quite warm um, when it's running in full power mode and there is a sort of fairly noticeable noise from that fan and this is the demonstration software that comes with it, so you've got the um, depth image on the left and the um, camera, visible camera image on the right. This is in the close-up mode where it reduces the power of the um, infrared emitters because you tend to find if you run it at full, you see the, the background, it's sort of very noisy, it's not picking up much in the background, but it's picking up me quite clearly. If I put it into full range mode, um, it picks up sort of everything in the room, but um, the white indicates that the sensor is saturating, so it's not able to get a depth value closer than um, probably about eight, about 80 centimetres or so. It depend, depends on the, how reflective the object is. And if I get a uh, dark object, it will probably handle that a lot closer. But it's just seeing so much light coming back in that mode. Um, and it will go up to um, 60 frames a second. This application, if you put it full for 60 frames a second and expand the window, it does sort of overrun and get a bit confused. But I think that's probably just my um, my, my PC not handling it. But um, so the response time is um, pretty good in uh, full frame, uh, full speed mode. One neat fe feature on this software: there's actually a little um, distance. It will show you the um, distance of the pixels at the cursor, and it's actually surprisingly stable. It seems to have a few millimetres resolution. Now one of the um, features of a time of flight camera is that it's because it, it, basically the way it works, unlike the Kinect which uses structured light where it sends a pattern and it uses the how that pattern appears on the objects to deduce the distance, what this does it sends out a very high frequency illumination signal and then measures phase differences between its internal um, time base. It, it, it can, it's effectively got an extremely fast shutter so it can actually modulate the, uh, the light source and control the shutter so it can actually measure very small differences in the, um, the time due to the actual time of flight. Now 
light travels approximately one nanosecond per foot. So the actual, to resolve say a millimetre, you're talking about tight, you know, times of the order of three picoseconds. Now, um, a traditional digital type approach to that, where you sort of have a counter and you, you know, send out light poles, have a counter and then measure when it comes back, you know, wouldn't really work because they need sort of tens or hundreds of gigahertz clock rate. So the way it's generally done is actually analog. Um, for example, um, laser rangefinders, the typical way they work is that they effectively generate a pulse whose length is proportional to the distance. So you have a pulse, you start the pulse when you send your light put your light out and then you stop it when it um, comes back and for the duration of that pulse you charge a capacitor and that effectively produces a time to voltage value which is pure analog so you're not you know you don't have to have ridiculously um, high resolution um, digital timing and I believe this works in a similar way the sensor does actually output analog voltage levels but obviously all the timings are very carefully controlled so that it can um, deduce the uh, the relative phase of the light source and the uh, detected. One thing this means is you actually get two sets of information from this. If we change the view on here, what it calls a confidence map. Now this is effectively the intensity information from the camera. Now you can see it's all saturating here. But it also means that because you're detecting both the phase and the, the amplitude, if you're detecting a good brightness then that gives you good confidence that that information is correct. Whereas if you're sort of really going into the into darkness then um, you know your, that, that data is going to be probably more no noisy and less reliable. And on the 3D thing, there is actually a threshold you can tell it. It's not. This is currently set to 50%. If I set that really low, that's now saying did, yeah, display a depth value for anything that you're at least 4% confident is real. So you can actually see a lot of the noise coming out in the background. So it is actually detecting further, but it's very noisy purely because it doesn't have the intensity. Whereas if I now put that onto distant mode that will boost up the intensity of the um, lighting so it's now actually got much better confidence so you can actually just about see it in the, in the um, background image and you know, within a room pretty much everything within the scene will give you a, uh, give you a reading so that, that, that black is just basically just due to the fact that it's saturating it's, it's just receiving too much light for the uh, pixels at close range I was playing around with an infrared LED just to see if I could confuse it and found a quite interesting effect that if you actually shine additional infrared and look at the confidence image, it's almost like you've got a dark emitting diode. It's sort of when it's off, you can just just see a little twinkle from the reflection. But as soon as you turn it on, it uh, looks like it's emitting darkness, which is uh, quite fun. Uh, as you'd expect, there's a slight trade-off between frame rate and sensitivity. This is in 50 frames a second mode. If I go down to 25 you'll see it can then pick up a little bit more detail out of the background. Um, you can also adjust the intensity of the illuminator directly here. Um, there is a full API provided um, so you can get access to all this information and they also do their, their own library for skeleton tracking and all that sort of stuff but um, I think that's something you actually have to pay extra money for. They, they do an evaluation version but you're not allowed to use it in company products but the access to all the um, depth information that does appear to be uh, available. Right so let's take a look inside this thing. This back thing just sort of clicks off quite easily and there's two screws. One was hidden behind the label and the other one by the um, this label. Well, the first thing you notice is this thing is sort of completely shielded. The infrared LEDs are running at quite high frequencies. So there's probably quite a lot of noise just because you're switching probably about an amp's worth of LEDs at um, something around 15 megahertz, so that in itself is going to kick out a certain amount of noise. There's the uh, little fan inside the case. Interesting where this plugs onto the on here. This looks like possibly a little afterthought board that's just got a little common mode filter on it. So this actually is plugging into a board on here. So I, I suspect maybe they found that um, the fan cable is actually radiating some um, RF interference. So to get it through the approvals, they probably had to stick this extra little board on to um, filter that before it goes onto the long wires. And so this shield is sort of, sort of, it's two parts, and it sort of clips over just with these uh, these clips here. Now a few of these clips um, actually sort of were bent inwards just to hold the PCB in, so it was a little bit of a fiddle to get this out. But it's not the shielding isn't soldered down or anything. It's uh, it's just slightly fiddly to actually get it out. Right, 
Right, so we've got a sort of sandwich of two boards. Um, nice big sort of gap all the way through for the air to get get past it to um, for cooling, which is quite nice. There's obviously there's vents on um, vents on both ends of the case, so you get quite a nice sort of clean airflow through the middle. And if you run it without, without the fan, this front board does get pretty warm pretty quickly. So um, on the front, obviously the notable thing is you've got quite a big lens now. Obviously. Um, because this thing, by its very nature, is going to be taking very short exposures um, because it's trying to measure the phase of the, um, the light pulses coming back. Um, it needs as much light as it can get, so you've got this big, sort of nice, big wide aperture um, lens on the front. These are um, just some conductive gaskets that make contact with the, uh, the front shield. They're just basically a piece of foam material with a sort of soft metallic sort of fabric type material around the outside, so these make um, a good and low, but low inductance contact with the uh, the front shield, and this seems to be the main the main point of connection to the shield. So this is clearly the thing they're most concerned about in terms of noise. So um, they've got the low inductance connection right here at the front. Um, there's a couple of these little MEMS microphones here, a couple of white LEDs. One lights up. I think one is power camera power, and one is uh, power for the LED board. The power supply seems to be completely separate because if you unplug the um, the LED USB thing. Although it does actually still produce a, a slight twinkle of, the, of an image, there's no actual illumination happening. So um, those power supplies seem to be separate, and there's it's obviously doing some sort of sensing to figure out whether it can draw the full power or whether it needs to run on um, a reduced power level. And on the front, there's a standard little um, color camera module, so fairly low res, standard sort of mobile phone type camera module there. Right, not a great deal on the uh, back of this board, there's a few names, Optrema, this is uh, the name of the company which I think was spun out from a university which developed the actual time of flight um, sensing technology, I'm not sure what that is, that's a um, serial flash prom which I'm pretty sure is going to be for the configuration data for this FPGA on the back, another 8 pin SO, don't know what that is and just lots of analog stuff, lots of big 100 microfarad tantalum caps. Because you bear in mind, you know, this sensor is analog, so it needs my stable power supply voltages because any noise is going to affect the um, the quality of the data it gets back. The two USBs again, we've got more of this shielding. So obviously, the user USB is going to be sort of the noisy bit. So um, you've got a nice low inductance connection to the shielding can on the back there, and there's a little crystal down there. Now one slightly annoying thing is the way this is built, the lens passes through the front board and it's then sort of fairly well glued into the lens holder so I um, actually need to, fortunately this, the base of this lens holder does unscrew. Um, there is this brass post, I think this is just mechanical just to ensure the right spacing, it's screwed on one, in one side but it just goes through a hole in the PCB so I think that's just a mechanical support to make sure that this board doesn't warp and um, upset the alignment of anything. anything. Right, the other side of this board is uh, a little bit more interesting. Um, 8 megabit SD RAM here. Um, this connector I'm guessing that's probably a JTAG connector for the FPGA. Um, it's an Altera EP1C3T144 FPGA. This is not a particularly big FPGA so it's not doing sort of huge amounts of uh, super clever stuff. It's uh, pretty much the bottom end of the uh, cyclone range about uh, eight quid one off in um, digikey so it's not not a hugely powerful FPGA. And next here we've got this um, Texas Instruments A to D converter so VSP5010. This is actually designed for things like scanners um, it's two channel 31 mega sample per second but 12 bits um, so obviously it's, it needs that uh, good analog resolution to get the, max, the maximum performance out of the sensor. Um, down here there's a little um, VI microchip. Now this is basically the same sort of chip they use in webcams. So this takes an image from a camera, a simple sort of parallel pixel stream from the camera and provides a USB interface into it. So obviously what's happening is this, all this depth processing stuff is producing basically a, you know, a depth image and that, that that's just then being um, interfaced via this. So you know, because obviously webcam type devices are extremely cheap you know, if you can buy an off-the-shelf chip that will do all the um, interfacing of that type of interface to USB, it probably makes more sense to do that than use, for example, a bigger FPGA and do it in there. So this outputs is going to be outputting a sort of fairly simple parallel stream of data. Now, whether that's the pure depth data or whether it's information that's then processed further on the PC, I don't know. 
but yeah, there's not a huge amount of processing going on here because this is not a particularly uh, big FPGA. Obviously, though they've struggled to get it onto the PCB in this package, I'm a bit surprised they didn't use a BGA. But this 144 quad flap pack obviously only just fits. And here we've actually got the depth sensor itself. Just only one thing I noticed: there isn't actually an infrared filter in the lens. You can see again, it's a nice, very big aperture lens there, but there's no infrared filter. So. Um, I would guess because the front of this looks looks sort of, it's got a fairly red tinge to it. The top layer of the um, cover of this is probably the infrared filter, and this is a BGA package. And again, there's more um, power supply stuff around here. Sort of big capacitors. It's a little unpopulated chip there, and this chip down here, which you don't even need to look it up to see what it is, because it actually says USB 2.0 hub on it. So this will be um, just splitting the USB because there's the depth camera and the uh, RGB camera, which are two separate USB devices. So that's just acting as a hub to uh, split those two devices out. And then we've got the connectors to the uh, the front PCB. And if you look at the uh, back of the front PCB, this is mostly the uh, the drivers for the LEDs. So looking at the overall sort of architecture for each group, we've got two sort of big inductors. So these are going to be buck regulators to regulate the voltage down to closer to what the LED wants. And then there's actually, it looks like a separate driver. Now whether these are actually ICs or just transistors, it's not, I'm not really clear. It, um, I think somewhere I did see, yeah, it does actually show U as the designator, but um, it could just be there to sort of transistor arrays or something. But if you're driving LEDs at sort of 15 megahertz, that's a non-trivial task. So they've, looking at the numbers, they've clearly got one driver per LED. And that's pretty much all there is on this board on the sides. The only other things we've got, there's another one of these um, Vi microchips that's controlling the, um, the RGB camera and there's a little E squared next to it which um, I'm sure that'll just be the code or the configuration data for this chip. Incidentally these chips have got, um, certainly this the one on this board has got an onboard um, 8051 based micro so that's maybe also doing a few odd little bits of sort of general management functions for this but there's probably not a huge amount of that it might be for example um, doing so, providing the interface to provide the uh, power to the LEDs because the, the LED power is controllable via USB so um, that will maybe happening um, on that chip but so apart from that that's pretty much all the hardware there is the rest they're just all these LEDs which I'd imagine these are probably just put in by some sort of jig that holds them in the right angle. They're, you know, they, they appear to be a bit random but I think they're, they're actually designed to produce a fairly uniform illumination pattern and I think the reason they use lots of separate LEDs rather than a few high power ones is one is cost but also so that the heat is distributed over the um, over a wider area and it may also be easier to use sort of multiple parallel low current drivers to drive the high frequency signal rather than a higher single higher or sort of maybe two high power LED so um, and also over here we've got looks like footprints for a large or sort of two large common mode chokes for reducing um, interference but those aren't fitted they've actually fitted sort of two smaller ferrite beads so this is one of these things where you it's hard to predict what the, the um, RF performance is going to be of a board like this so you, it's quite common just design the board to take a few options and then populate them based on what performs better in fact here they've actually got one ferrite bead and one zero ohm resistor and these, these will be um, going to the USB connections, probably the USB power supplies because that's where, where most of the noise is going to be um, coming out. Right, I wanted to see if I can um, actually see any details on the dial of this. This, um, of course this has got an infrared filter over the front so we can't um, see through it. So um, I had a quick look, this is a, one of these cheap uh, USB microscopes. Now this is normally illuminated by these white LEDs which is obviously no good for infrared because what we need is a um, a source that has infrared content and a sensor. Now this looks like this device doesn't have either doesn't have an infrared filter or it's a fairly weak one. So this is does actually have quite good response in the infrared. So what I was looking at doing was just sort of turn off the internal illumination and then just use an incandescent. This is a halogen lamp. Um, if you run these quite dim, they've still got quite a high infrared content. Um, you can use an infrared filter like this um, just to mask out all the visible light. But I found that wasn't actually all that necessary. Right, with normal illumination we can see a little bit through it, that's because we've got a bit of ambient light with some infrared um, content, but if we uh, turn that off and just look in the infrared, so you can see we can now see right through that window, um, we actually see a little bit of detail on the chip. 
Incidentally, it's quite a large die for I think it's 120 by 160 sensor, but obviously uh, it needs to be able to get as much light as it's possible. So the actual pixel size is going to be quite big, which is why the die is quite big um, compared to a normal sort of video um, sensor die. But that resolution should be far, far smaller. So we can see a few little details around the edge. Um, there's no obvious de you know, circuitry on the actual die itself, so it looks like it's probably a fairly dumb array. Um, it's, it's a little bit hard to see the detail, and it's possible it could even be two stacked die in there. There's sort of some things that maybe suggest a two-level thing, but I just can't see enough detail to uh, tell for sure. Right, just for amusement, I thought it'd be fun to try measuring the uh, characteristics of the filter on the um, top of that chip. Um, what we've got here, we've got um, halogen light source going into a monochromate. Now, what this is basically is a, a calibrated diffraction grating. There's some optics, but basically it will... Um, light goes in and then when it comes out you can actually select the wavelength you want on this uh, dial this just changes the angle of a diffraction grating um, so the light's coming out shining on the surface and then being reflected back to this um, black and white TV camera which is sensitive to infrared so we should be able to um, see changes in the, uh, the this filter looks like it's a reflective filter so it's designed to sort of reflect all the wavelengths except the ones it's interested in so what we should see is a dip in the um, reflected light as we get to the um, center the center wavelength of the filter right so this is the view through that camera I'm just shining some visible light on this so you can see the setup that bright line at the bottom is the um, output from the monochromator so if I now adjust the wavelength it's starting to dip there at 720 nanometers and then that's probably about the darkest it gets so that's 755 nanometers so that's its peak the peak no, the wavelength that it's letting through to the sensor and then the other edge is at about 770 nanometers so it's a fairly narrow band um, optical filter so this is the view that that cat black and white camera was seeing just showing the visible wavelength so you can see as I increase the wavelength, you can see that colour's ch changing down towards red and then it heads down to the infrared, this camera isn't, obviously isn't sensitive, cause it, it's sensitive to that because it's a colour camera but you can see the, uh, the visible wavelengths so up through green, blue and then up through, heads towards the ultraviolet right, so I'm just going to try um, actually measuring the optical bandwidth of the device using its own emitters. So what I've got is a piece of um, black tubing just to shield the sensor from the light from the uh, the LEDs and just sort of shining some of the LEDs into the monochromator and then using the, um, the confidence display to get an effectively a monochrome image just to see um, over what wavelength it responds. Right, so um, we're not really seeing anything in the confidence display, but we do have a depth result. Um, so that starts up to appear at about 790 nanometers, and then sort of disappears off around 890. So we're centered, we're pretty much centered on 850. So that's the, that's the peak emission of the LED. Um, I suspect that reflection characteristic of the filter is probably not the whole story. Um, I couldn't immediately figure out a way to actually get the light shining through it to bounce off the sensor so you could actually see it in a camera. I just couldn't get enough light through the monochromator to do that so um, it may be the reflection characteristic of that, that sensor, of that um, filter was only providing part of the um, optical characteristics and there's probably a transmission uh, component to it as well. But um, this, you know, it does seem to be peaking around 850. Um, with about 100 nanometers width of sensitivity. Right, let's take a look at the uh, waveforms that are actually coming out of the illuminator on this thing. Um, this is the uh, this is the sort of slow view showing that it's um, sending bursts, and as we adjust the um, illumination power, we can see it's changing the um, length of that burst. So what it's effectively doing is adjusting exposure time as the means of adjusting the average uh, LED power. Uh, this is running in uh, 25 frames a second mode and we're seeing 500 bursts a second so it looks like it's probably averaging 10 frames to get the result. Uh, as we change the different frame rates, the only difference we see is this changing between 500 and 480 hertz so it's obviously using different division ratios 
on a fairly sort of similar frame rate to get the final frame rate. And if we look at the fine detail, you actually see that it's using a dithered waveform, which is pretty much as expected, because if you're, if you're making a phase measurement, obviously the, there are potentially other things like noise that can give you the wrong answer. So what they're clearly doing is making measurements over a range of frequencies, and then probably just averaging those to get the most plausible result that's actually representative of the phase of the um, incoming light, and not any other sort of internal fixed errors or um, anything else that might give a false, uh, yeah, a false reading. So this is actually varying from so 16 down to 14 megahertz. Um, it seems to be using a fairly sort of random waveform. It's not doesn't seem to be uh, in any pattern. If we use um, segmented memory to actually capture a large number of uh, waveforms, see so sort of from waveform to waveform, we're not seeing any gradual increase or decreasing. It sort of seems to be pretty pseudo random. And again, a pseudo random pattern would again help to eliminate noise for example things like um, 50 hertz or 100 hertz background illumination variation if you used a, um, a sort of frequency varying on a regular pattern you might get some sort of strobing and um, beat type effects there so by using a sort of fairly random illumination that's going to eliminate a lot of that so just by averaging out several readings any regular frequency interference is going to get um, eliminated. One interesting little effect is when I put the scope probe on it actually affects the distance value, which of course is as expected because this thing is measuring extremely small phase changes. So just the addition of that scope probe is producing the equivalent of about 30 millimetres of additional range purely because of the small amount of capacitance of that probe delaying that signal very slightly and altering the, um, the phase measurement. Um, one other th thing I noticed, it does actually seem to be doing some, doing some measurements based on a different time base fairly infrequently. Um, if you go to close mode, it actually reduces the, um, the sampling time, so it's increasing the frequency. Obviously it's interested in stuff that's closer, so it's going now, it's now in the sort of 30, 27 to 30 megahertz region in close up mode. It doesn't, you know, if nothing else, it doesn't need to leave enough time for any other reflections to come back, because it's only interested in the stuff that's, that's close up. But you can also see this other sort of less frequent pulse, sort of, again it's sort of sweeping sort of relatively slowly. Quite sure what that will be doing. Right, just a fun little experiment. I've um, disconnected the line that controls the LED modulation and just connected it to a long piece of wire so I can basically delay the signal. It's got a piece of uh, cobalt clad board with the edge just insulated so my hand capacitance isn't affecting it. So by um, shorting a different place along the wire I can actually control the delay of the illuminator well, I've got it just looking at a fairly flat black target just to give it something a nice stable reading. And if I start reducing the length of this cable, this uh, signal, you'll see the distance value changing as the uh, illuminated delay is, is reduced and increased. So you can actually see the effect of the delay of a signal just going down a piece of ordinary wire. And if I actually make, make some measurements, um, I've just marked out a, uh, a half metre distance round trip on this. So if we go to the zero, we're getting 0 0.374 metres. And here it's reading 0 0.78. And if we just work out that in terms of the uh, light distance, point and that's giving a distance of, um, so that's giving a change in 0.4 meters. So the speed of the uh, signal down this wire is sort of of the order of 0.8, the speed of light. That's quite a nice little uh, instant demonstration. I can also show the effect of inductance on the delay. If I uh, just put a piece of ferrite across here, which increases the inductance, again, you can see it's increasing the um, distance value slightly. I'll just wound it into a coil and see what happens as we gradually unwind that coil. It's now showing a distance of about one and a half metres. If I just stretch this coil out, it's now down to about 1.2. Right, I'll just rig this up with um, just some extension leads so I can actually run it open. I'm just going to have a quick poke around the analogue signals coming out of this um, 
sensor see if it make any sense out what's actually coming out of the sensor. All right, at the top we've got the illumination signal and the bottom is the analog out from the uh, sensor. So you can see it's sort of doing a burst of illumination then reading all the data out. Um, if I just re adjust the um, brightness value you just see it's altering the effect of it, I'm guessing the exposure time. If we put it into close-up mode um, you can see it's doing a much shorter exposure followed by a more sort of immediate readback. That's at 25 frames a second if I can take it up to 60 frames a second. Doesn't actually seem to make I think I think from what I saw last time the frame per second is more about how many frames it averages out rather than the actual um, acquisition time. So we put the illumination up to 100 percent You see most of it we then got sort of it's either doing the acquisition or the readback, so the readback seems to take a fairly fixed amount of time. And if I sort of wave my um, hand around, you can actually see some uh, data, but it's not very easy to make much sense of it. You know, if I put my hand closer, I get more of a signal, but that could, could be intensity, because you, you know, we've got intensity and phase information here. Um, looks like we're seeing the result of a few a few frames. I'll set the hold off just to grab one of the sort of subframes which are happening at um, which are happening at about 500 hertz. And we can see the sort of the mul there's multiple different sets of data that probably corresponds to different timing of the um, illuminator. And we can sort of clearly see that if I move my hand up and down, we're sort of moving in that direction and. In the other direction we should see motion sort of across the line here but um, it's hard to know really what this information you know, to what extent this information is the phase versus the um, intensity data it's probably a combination of the two um, what I'm guessing is happening is while it's doing the illumination it's sending some sort of high speed gating signals to the, the, the sensor array so that, that controls um, the relative phasing of the acquisition of the um, light signal, so it basically it's like a probably like a very fast shutter, and by um, altering the sort of phase relationship between the illuminator and the um, the gating on the sensor, then that that allows it to measure the uh, phase shift information to get the um, the high resolution distance and therefore the uh, high, high resolution timing and therefore distance data but uh, I don't think there's really a great deal more information that can be extracted about that. You know, I'm just poking around the pins that connect the FPGA to the Vimicro camera USB interface and it's clear that it's only sending back frames at the sort of the frame rate that the PC is seeing it. So all the averaging of the frames and everything is clearly being done by the FPGA. If I change the frame rate we'll see the you know, the frame rate being sent back to the PC change. Um, but the basic sampling rate appears to be the same, so it's probably just doing an average of however many frames of a, you know, of a fixed multiple to get the um, frame rate that the uh, PC's requested. And if I change it to close-up mode, the only difference is the exposure time uh, changes. Uh, something I just noticed, this um, white LED here actually indicates the infrared power. So if I put it onto full power mode, it lights up brightly and if you reduce the power it goes dim. These are also status indicators if you disable the camera. So like for example if I um, disable the RGB camera you see that LED goes out and if I disable the uh, depth camera that one. So these are status indicators but that also indicates the um, intensity of the uh, infrared illumination. Well, it looks like the um it looks like this sensor is made by Texas Instruments. I found a little bit of information on the website, not a great deal, no data sheets or anything interesting. Um, but they showed two products, um, 160 by 120 and a 320 by 240. But there's not really a great deal of information on that. They also show some information about a, um, a controller chip. Now whether that's a custom chip or just an FPGA is not entirely clear because I know on some of their DLP products what they sell as a sort of custom controller is in fact just an Altera FPGA with their code but it gives a bit of um, sort of system block diagram 
Um, this shows it using DDR2 memory, whereas this um, the center I've got uses standard SD RAM. But there's not really a huge amount of information. Also, yeah, it shows um, an LVDS interface to the front end, whereas this I think uses parallel using that um, CCD analog front end chip. So um, this information is probably sort of more to do with the next generation solution, whereas the um, the current cameras are based on fairly off the shelf hardware apart from the um, the actual sensor itself. So interesting little bit of tech there. Um, there are one or two other players in this field now. There's, there seems to be sort of quite a few time of flight sensors appearing on the market. Um, and I believe Microsoft have actually bought a company that produced one um, which they're integrating in the new Xbox um, Kinect replacement. Um, and I'll see how this one, this bit, yeah, this is a fairly early one. This sold as sort of more of a development kit than a sort of a consumer product at this stage. And yeah, because it's made out of relatively off the shelf parts, relatively accessible things, yeah, there might be a scope for actually sort of fiddling and doing interesting things with it, although I'm not really sure what. I mean, although it is in principle capable of capturing very fast events, you certainly couldn't use it as a standard, yeah, as a general purpose high speed video camera because you're limited by how fast you can get data out of the chip. But I mean, there might be some scope for fiddling with timings to maybe capture very high speed single shot events or something. Um, I don't really know. I'm not really don't really know exactly um, what this sensor is capable of. But I do remember reading something fairly recently about some a university who produced some uh, sort of path of light videos, actually showing sort of the progress of a beam of light by modifying some. I don't know if it was this sensor or something very similar. So perhaps by you know, doing something with the um, illumination, maybe gating it or changing that, you might be able to do some interesting things with that, I don't know. So, um, but say it's a quite fun little bit of kit and uh, I think it's something interesting to do with it now.